The first minute I saw it from the back of the taxi cab, you know, when, when we took the, you know, got off the plane and I saw the Miami Beach skyline and the, and the blue water and everything, like I just felt like I'd come home. I never felt at home in New Jersey. It must have been just a bad accident of birth that I happened to be born up there. So I never went back, well, I went back to pack and everything, but I was determined to live here. So I just, I loved it. And it was paradise then. You could drive all the way down Collins Avenue and see the ocean all the way. Late one Sunday night, ex-con Gary Robinson drunkenly shoved his way to the front of a line at a church's outlet. The cashier eventually persuaded Robinson to wait his turn for the three-piece fried chicken. And about five to 10 minutes later, he found his way back up at the front. Unfortunately for Mr. Robinson, they had just ran out of fried chicken. The cashier, feeling rather uncomfortable, tried to turn his attention to the chicken nuggets. Robinson responded by punching her in the face. This was the catalyst to utter chaos in the outlet, which ultimately led to Robinson being shot by a security guard. And Buchanan of the Miami Herald covered the murder. Her famous opening to the story, Gary Robinson died hungry. People often said murder wouldn't even take place without Edna being around. The Patterson, New Jersey, Polish girl that used to read crime stories to her foreign grandmother eventually made her way over to Miami as a journalist, owning two guns, one in her house and one in her car. Don't let your eyes deceive you. Edna is one tough cookie. Calvin Trillin of The New Yorker states, all concierge would agree, I think, that the classic Edna lead would have to include one staple of crime reporting, the simple, matter-of-fact statement that registers with a jolt. Edna's technique is what the Herald calls the Miller Chop, which refers to then-Herald editor and Pulitzer Prize winner Gene Miller. Miller, like Buchanan, has a liking for short sentences, claiming that he writes as if he were paid by the period. Anyways, Miller and Edna teamed up for a story on a renowned lawyer who was shot to death while visiting the La Gorse Country Club. The lead looked something like this. He had his golf clubs in the trunk of his Cadillac. Wednesday looked like an easy day. He figured he might pick up a game later with Eddie Arcaro, the jockey. He didn't. She's a reporter with a mission, a mission to grab a hold of the audience and never let go. Her methods are a bit unorthodox, but never has the Herald seen such passion. Trillin of the New Yorker wrote an entire piece on Edna called Covering the Cops, where he interviewed her out of a rumor that she knows most of, if not all of the cops in Dade County. Let me remind you that back when, Dade County had 27 separate police forces with more than 4,500 officers. Since Edna was a rather old fashioned name, cops would never confuse her with something else. Her name spread and it was there to say. When Edna Buchanan began covering the cops, for the Herald in 1973, there hadn't been anyone assigned full-time to the beat in several years, writes Trillin. Continuing with the interview, Edna describes her three newsroom rules. Never trust an editor, never trust an editor, and never trust an editor. Some will leave out an interesting detail in a story just because of how appalling or horrifying it is to them. One of them kept saying that people read this paper at breakfast, while Edna's perfect lead, on the other hand, would, quote unquote, cause a reader eating breakfast with his wife to spit out his coffee, clutch his chest and say, my God, Martha, did you read this? Now let's say a murder takes place. Edna's approach to gathering the details are quite unusual, yet effective. Instead of standing behind the yellow police tape, hounding officers for the nitty gritty, Edna returned to the Herald and used her telephone to gather the details. The details, however, didn't come so easily. Most people on the first time, on the first time call, angrily shouted at her for calling at such a terrible time before slamming down the phone. But Edna didn't stop there. Her method was to give it exactly 60 seconds, then call for a second time, thinking someone else in the family would be willing to give more evidence. Guess what? She was right. As Trillin states it, she is not an easy person to say goodbye to. Death never really seemed to bother her because it was an occasion every day in the 80s. Trillin concludes his extensive report on Edna by explaining how Miami became the state with the highest murder rate in the country. In the late 70s, Miami Miami, like other American cities, had a steady increase in the sort of murders that occurred when, say, an armed man panics while he is robbing a convenience store. It also has some political bombings and some shootings between outfits that were, depending on your point of view, either running drugs to raise money for fighting Fidel or using the fight against Fidel as a cover-up for running drugs. At the end of the decade, Dade County's murder rate took an astonishing upturn. Around that time, the Colombians who manufactured the drugs began distributed in Miami by Cubans decided to eliminate the middleman and given a peculiar viciousness in the way they customarily operated that sometimes meant eliminating the middleman's wife and whoever else happened to be around. Within a couple of years after the Colombians began their campaign to reduce overhead, Miami was hit with the burial boat lift refugees. In 1977, there were 211 murders in Dade County. By 1981, the high point of Dade murder, there were 621. That meant, according to one homicide detector I spoke to, that Miami experienced the greatest increase in murders per capita that any city has ever recorded. It also meant that Miami had the highest murder rate in the country. It also meant that a police reporter could 
could drive to work in the morning knowing that there would almost certainly be at least one murder to write about. Stephanie Mansfield of the Washington Post wrote an article in December of 1987 on Edna Buchanan, and is now archived by the LA Times. Mansfield wrote, As a premier police scribe in the country, Edna Buchanan is the queen of crime, the maven of mayhem, the sultana of stiffs. Similar to Trillin's report, Mansfield compares covering murder in 1980s Miami, comparable to covering Chicago in the 20s. After the influx of drugs in the Mario boat lift from Cuba in 1980, Miami went off the crime-o-meter, she says. Though this is extremely over-exaggerated, I think Mansfield cleverly sets the stage for how dangerous Miami had become around that time. Something new Mansfield brings to the table is Edna's extremely dark sense of humor. Her pithy sentences were so engaging, yet so dark. Mansfield, in an interview with Edna, records one of her responses that perfectly embody her sense of humor. People really are funny, she says, shaking her bouffant. Like the 89-year-old man, rejected suitor, who was irate. He made a Molotov cocktail and threw it through the window of his sweetheart, a widow in her 60s, who had rejected him for a younger man in his 70s. Well, anyway, she stamped out the fire and she knew at once it was him, because he had left this telltale clue. Not only that the Molotov cocktail had been fashioned in this prune juice bottle, it was his brand. What an idiot. Crime is gritty and often a taxing field to work in for anyone's psyche. Yet Edna tries to find the light in between all the darkness. All right, that's enough from me. How about we actually hear from Edna herself on covering the police beat? As a little exposition for the video, Edna explains in almost perfect detail a robbery that went down at a liquor store when she was still posted at the Sun. You started covering crime a lot. Yeah. And you and became it, noted for that, right? Uh, yeah, and as well as everything else, like writing the letters to the editor and picking the dogs and the celebrities and the the, politici the politics, um, I also enjoyed covering the police beat. And I remember one day it was interesting. Um, my mother had moved down here as well. And she called me one day at the paper and said, uh, there's police shooting it out with, I think the Black Panthers on Pine Tree Drive. There's a shooting in progress. I think it was like a Sunday afternoon or something. So I go racing over there and sure enough, this cop named Ed Young had gotten shot in the hand. Thankfully, he was okay. But it was a, a major shooting and stuff, and I covered it. With the Black Panthers? And, yeah. And these people were members of the Black Panthers, and, and all this, you know, went on. And so I got the story, and the Herald and, and all the TV stations were furious the next day. And they were saying that I had some special treatment, that somebody must have called me to tell me about it from the police station. If they were going to call me, they should have called everybody. And, and I kept insisting my mother <laughs> called me, and yes, she's not going to call everybody. Call me my mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, let me tell you about the, the, um, the robbery at the liquor store. I'm sitting there mid-morning one day at my desk at the Miami Beach Sun, and there's a, a call going out, a robbery, in, armed robbery in progress at a liquor store on 5th Street. So I assumed the cops were already there since it was so close to the police station, which is 120 Meridian Avenue then, the small old station. So I go racing to 5th Street to the liquor store, and I didn't see any police or anything there, but I saw that, you know, I knew that was the place. So um, I went to go into the liquor store, and this guy comes running out past me, and that was the owner. He comes running past me. So he, I, you know, he went, and I just grabbed the door and went in. And so um, all I could find was this guy. There were a lot of broken whiskey bottles all over the floor and this guy cringing in the corner. And, um, and so I went up to him and I said, what happened? Which way did they go? Um, you know, what, what, who were they? What did they look like? And he, he just kept looking at me and he never answered. And, um, and then I looked up and there were all these cops lined up looking through the plate glass window and they're beckoning me to come out. And, and I didn't want to go out because the cops always spoil your fun. I hadn't gotten any, any quotes worth printing from this guy yet, and they would whisk him off as a witness, and I wouldn't get a chance to talk to him. So I sort of, you know, ignored them, and I was talking to, you know, said, wait a minute, you know, and I'm talking to this guy. And so finally, uh, the police began to yell and shout, you know, to come out. And so I, I went out, and they went running into the store and tackled him. He was the robber. What's pretty incredible about Edna is that she was, according to Matt Meltzer of MiamiBeach411.com, the lone woman in a field saturated by men and still produced the stories none of them could, digging a little deeper and talking to people other reporters ignored, ensuring every story she told was the whole story. This idea of gender diversity is somewhat overlooked for the time. With over 3,000 murder cases covered, it wouldn't be inappropriate to say that Edna excelled at her job. As incredible as Edna was and still is, I thought it would be best to end with my favorite quotation from her. No, it's probably not the one you're thinking of. Nothing wraps up her story more perfectly than this. You can leave Miami, but Miami never really leaves you.